Aloha and good afternoon. Welcome to This Is Now. I'm Dylan Enchetta. Ashley has the day off. We start today with the latest on the Mike Miski trial. It's continuing in federal court with more testimony from a woman who knew one of the men involved. Here's the latest. <laughs> This morning, our cameras spotted Jonathan Frazier's girlfriend, Ashley Wong, heading into federal court. She was holding a Justice for Jonathan t-shirt. Our team in court says Wong, who is the mother of his child, testified tearfully about the moment she believed she and Johnny had been set up and he'd been taken. Her fears were also conveyed to police when things unfolded. Yesterday on the stand, the focus was on the crash that led to the eventual death of Miski's son, Caleb, and Frazier's subsequent disappearance. Wong testified about the nature of Caleb and Frazier's friendship leading up to that 2015 crash. Wong said that Caleb was the driver and Frazier was in the passenger seat. She told prosecutors that Miski was misinformed and thought Frazier was the one driving and blamed him. Frazier went missing in July 2016 and prosecutors believe Miski is responsible for Frazier's death. We will have more on this story in later editions of our newscast. And new at noon, 911 is back up and running after experiencing issues today. Problems were reported in Honolulu and at least four other states across the U.S., including areas of Nevada, Nebraska, Texas, and the entire state of South Dakota. Service has also been restored in Las Vegas following a two-hour outage. It's unclear exactly how long Honolulu's outage was or what caused the issue. However, just before 10 a.m., HPD said all services were restored. And now to an overnight crash investigation. A woman was critically hurt after she was pinned between two two cars. It happened around 1020 last night on Kapu Kavai Street in Royal Kunia. The woman was standing in front of a parked car, which police say was then rear-ended. This sent the car moving forward and into another parked car. The pedestrian was eventually freed and rushed to the hospital. The 34-year-old driver was not hurt. Police believe she was speeding and had been drinking. She is believed to be a repeat offender of driving under the influence. Donald Trump is back in a Manhattan courtroom today in his historic criminal trial. As jury selection continues, HNN senior national correspondent Peter Zampa is on the crown just outside court. Peter, what is the latest in selecting jurors? Well, let me tell you, it's quite the roller coaster here at Criminal Court in Lower Manhattan for this historic case. But at the start of the day, we had seven jurors seated. Then that number went down to five. Two had to be excused. One woman said she had concerns about her identity being released. And let's just say this first, anonymity is key in a case like this, where there is so much furor on both sides, a lot of energy around such a high-profile defendant that they want to try to keep things secret. Well, she said that they did not do a good job of that. She had concerns for her safety. She was excused. And then later in the day, another gentleman was excused. The rationale for that, a little bit more unclear. It appears there may have been questions over his questionnaire. He was excused. But by the end of the day, we started to really ramp up and we got seven more jurors seated. So we got to that 12 number. That's key. But you also need six alternates. So there still is a bit of work to do. Got it. And what else have you learned inside court today? Well, there were quite a few things. Uh, one, the prosecution brought back up this issue of Donald Trump's gag order. They say he continues to violate this gag order, almost begging this judge to hold him in contempt of court. Now, the judge said, look, we're going to deal with all of this on April 23rd. That's next week when they hold a hearing over his gag order and whether he should be found in contempt of court. But the prosecution clearly not happy that Donald Trump continues to take to social media, bashing this case and relevant people surrounding this case. Yeah, you know, going to some news in Washington, House members are preparing to vote on aid packages for Israel and Ukraine in the coming days. What is the latest there? Well, you think there's chaos out here in Manhattan. <laughs> there's a lot more on Capitol Hill right now surrounding these aid packages. Really, it comes down to conservative House Republicans. We've heard this a lot over the last couple of years, but they're upset about sending this aid to Ukraine. And they're even threatening Speaker Mike Johnson's job over it because they do not want this package to move forward. Right now, it's going through the rigorous process in the House Rules Committee, where some of those conservative hard hardliners are members, are, are seated on that committee. So we'll see how this progress moves forward because it has to go through the rules process to figure out exactly what these packages look like before it reaches the House floor. In the coming days, they are expecting a vote, but we'll see how far this moves along in the coming hours. 
Yeah, definitely something that we'll be keeping an eye on. Thank you so much for all your reporting, Peter. Have a good one. The U.S. House could vote as soon as this week on foreign aid bills to help Ukraine, Israel, and the Indo-Pacific. The national security assistance has been stuck in Congress for weeks, but it comes at a critical time for U.S. allies. Natalie Brand reports. Come to order. A long-awaited aid package to provide U.S. allies with critically needed funds has its first big test today before the House Rules Committee. I have been saying for months we need to support our friends and allies around the world now. This bill is probably one of the most important votes we'll have in our careers. The House plan includes three separate bills with more than $60 billion in security assistance for Ukraine and $26 billion for Israel. Another $8 billion is pegged for the Indo-Pacific with the goal of countering China. Speaking with foreign ministers at the G7 meeting, Secretary of State Antony Blinken and his Ukrainian counterpart laid out what's at stake. If Putin is allowed to proceed with impunity, we know he won't stop at Ukraine. House Speaker Mike Johnson, aiming for a final vote this weekend, must try to win over conservatives. I'm doing here what I believe to be the right thing. Um, I think pr providing lethal aid to Ukraine right now is critically important. Speaker Johnson hopes by putting separate bills on the floor, it increases the chances of passage. If he loses members of his own party, he's going to need Democratic support. We are not going to allow America's national security interests to be undermined. President Biden has indicated support for the package. It could come at a cost for Speaker Johnson with Georgia Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene threatening to trigger a vote to oust him as Speaker. Natalie Brand, CBS News, Capitol Hill. Now to the Middle East where Israel is vowing a response to Iran's attack on the country Sunday. CNN's Jeremy Diamond shows us the size of one of the hundreds of missiles the Israeli military says was fired by Iran. This is just one piece of an Iranian ballistic missile that the Israeli military says Iran fired towards Israel over the weekend at 36 feet long. This is just the fuel tank for that missile. The Israeli military says more than 120 ballistic missiles were fired at Israel in this attack, only a handful of them actually making it through Israel's air defense systems. And the Israeli military believes this missile was likely intercepted. You can see the holes in the sides of this fuel tank. This missile was actually found in the Dead Sea. It was recovered and it was taken to this base in southern Israel. But now Israel says it must respond. It must reestablish deterrence. They say this attack cannot go unanswered. The only question now is how the Israeli military will respond and when. And so when you see that video, you can really just get a sense of the size and the scale of these missiles and the destructive power that they could potentially deliver. I'm told that the warhead on top of that missile would typically weigh about a half a ton, a half a ton of explosives of destructive power. And so you can just think if these missiles had indeed made it through Israel's air defense system, the kind of destruction that they could have caused. We also spoke with the Israeli military's top spokesman, Daniel Hagari. He told us that the timing and the mode of this Israeli response to this Iranian attack would be decided by them at a time of their choosing, but he did say that it would come. Jeremy Diamond, CNN, Tel Aviv. Back here at home after a large jump in pay last summer, city leaders are once again up for another raise, and some say it's too much. Even council members say the system needs to be changed. As our Ben Gutierrez reports, they're pushing to get voters involved. Last year's huge pay hike was still echoing through the city council chambers as its members tackled several resolutions aimed at keeping it from happening again. The Honolulu Salary Commission is considering 3% raises for city officials this year, including city council members. Yes, it's still on the table, uh, you know, but the main concern was what happened six months ago with the 64% and people still, you know, upset about that. That boosted their pay from about $69,000 to about $113,000, although Council Members Augie Toba, Andrea Tupola, and Radiant Cordero refused it. Hopefully we can discuss this and get something so that any future council doesn't have to face what we did last year. The full council discussed several proposed charter amendments to prevent a repeat. They include a resolution to limit future pay increases for city employees to 10% a year. The head of the Salary Commission, which acts independently, says last year's big increase was a correction because many previous city councils had turned down pay hikes and also because of their workload.
To me, that if you're on call 24-7, responding to your constituencies and working here 60 to 80 hours, we made the correction to your salaries as such. There's also a measure to give the council more power to reject races with a simple majority vote instead of a three-quarter supermajority, while another would require public hearings on pay hikes. The public must have the right to discuss and participate in all the proposed salary commissions. So we should not be allowing a unelected commission to have so much power, whatever it is. You know, we got to lead by example, and it's taxpayers' money, so they should have a say in how the process is done. Others want changes to the commission itself. Well, the other thought that I had was using our good governance nonprofit organizations like the um, Common Cause Hawaii, um, League of Women Voters, those types of organizations to have a representative on the commission. The measures were unanimously approved by the eight council members present. They still face committee hearings and a final council vote before heading to the mayor and then the ballot. A lot of what the salary commission does is dictate, not a lot, all of it is dictated in the charter. So unless we put those guardrails or that guidance in the charter, then they have only that to follow. Ben Gutierrez, Hawaii News Now. Meanwhile, city leaders also say the Safe and Sound Waikiki program which was launched 18 months ago, has led to a broad drop in crime. We're told murders, robberies, burglaries, auto thefts, property damage, and drug offenses are all down by about a third. Since September 2022, there have been 3,000 arrests and citations. Police, prosecutors, and community partners focused on homeless outreach, zero tolerance for park violations and petty crimes, and a ban on repeat offenders returning to Waikiki. We're work, trying to work with the judges to get them to understand how you know, serious this is, that people can get hurt. And I think they came around to the geographic restrictions. We'll hope they'll, they'll be coming around more with uh, some more time in jail. We've also placed 30 folks into shelter. Uh, 14 people have also accepted on-the-street medication. Um, the numbers have grown since, since this, yes. so it was 14 people. Um, and four of them have been placed into respite centers, so areas where they can get treatment or detox support. The only outlier reports of disorderly conduct that jumped by 45%. And it's National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week, which honors the emergency dispatchers who work to keep us all safe. Ocean Safety Dispatcher Jared Jovero is one of them, helping to keep people safe in the water. Sometimes it takes a while if there's no lifeguard tower nearby. On February 20th, Jovero stayed on the line with a caller for eight minutes at Laie Point after a young woman jumped off the rocks and couldn't get back to the shore. I'm so tired. She's getting real tired. She's panicking. Yeah, yeah. I urge the caller to send one of her friends to go look for one of those rescue tubes that are strategically placed around the island. They were able to throw that rescue tube to the person in trouble and essentially save her life. Nonprofit groups recently donated 20 rescue tubes to be placed along 20 miles of Oahu's unguarded shorelines. Mahalo to all of our dispatchers for their incredible work. Let's send you live outside for a look over Honolulu. It's a beautiful Thursday afternoon. Temperature is about 79 degrees coming up on 1214 here this afternoon. Stay with us after this short break. We're going to have your local weather and more news.
follows it on this Thursday. We've got trade wind weather for the next several days, basically the best weather on the planet. But this morning we start out with clouds and showers, mainly for Kauai. And the Wahoo rainfall totals will be light, but the, there are enough clouds on the way to make it a little wet uh, to start the Thursday. We're expecting drier conditions by the afternoon, both for Kauai and the Wahoo, especially for the leeward sides. And the trade winds are now moving in, and they'll be in control for the next several days, running at moderate speeds. So we've got a beautiful day ahead. A little bit of a wet start for the west end of the state, yes, but we're still expecting lots of leeward sunshine by the afternoon. High temperatures running to about 82 degrees. And as far as the surf, it's going to be dropping, but we've still got energy up in the country, small on the west side. This swell's got more of a northerly component to it. And south shores still kicking with that swell, overlapping swells, uh, offering some head high sets with some pluses every now and then, and that UV index will be extreme. As it will be over the next several, several days, we've got trade winds coming in at 10 to 20 today. They'll be filling in and holding firm into next week. The overall weather pattern is not going to change. We are expecting lots of sunshine, but you also got to add in the stray shower, mainly for windward areas, mainly in the early morning and overnight hours. In today's news from the feeds, Ontario police have made arrests connected to the largest gold heist in Canadian history. It was exactly one year ago that thieves made off with about $20 million worth of the precious metal. They also got away with $2 million cash from Toronto Pearson's airport. CBC's Marianne Demain has the latest. This was an extensive investigation, not only involving police in Canada, but also in the United States. And now one year later, at a news conference this morning, investigators revealed that they have now arrested nine people, including someone who used to work for Air Canada, as well as someone who works at a jewelry store. They also announced that they have three Canada-wide warrants for three more suspects, including someone who is a manager with Air Canada. They also revealed details on how they believe this heist was pulled off in the first place. And here's what we know. $20 million in gold bars and $2 million in foreign currency was flown in from Zurich, Switzerland to Toronto on board an Air Canada flight and then loaded into a storage facility on the afternoon of April 17th of last year. On that same afternoon, police say the suspect truck reversed into the loading dock. A fraudulent document from an unrelated delivery was printed off within Air Canada's cargo facility and was given to an attendant to access the cargo. With the help of a forklift, the golden cash were then loaded onto the truck, which then drove away. And it wasn't until that evening that Brinks, which is the security company commissioned by two Swiss banks to oversee that cargo, discovered that it was gone. Police say that given the employment information of some of the accused in this case, they believe this was an inside job. Because of their position within Air Canada, in my, in my opinion, yeah, they needed people inside Air Canada to facilitate this theft. Now, so far, 90 grand of the $20 million of pure gold has been recovered in the form of bangles. $430,000 has also been recovered along with 65 firearms. The arrests were the result of Project 24 Carat. That was a joint task force with Canadian and American law enforcement. But this is a much larger investigation because officials now also believe that this heist is connected to a weapons trafficking ring. The Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Explosives says it was a traffic stop in the United States last fall that led to the discovery of firearms that police allege were headed to Canada and part of an international firearms trafficking ring. We believe that they've melted down the gold and then the profits they got from the gold they used to help finance the firearm, obviously purchasing the illegal firearms and that, and provide transportation and accommodation and that to get them up here. So we believe that's how the gold money has, has now kind of worked into the firearms trafficking aspect of the investigation. Police say the investigation is ongoing. Marianne Demain, CBC News, Toronto. Mortgage rates are once again on the rise. The average long-term rate has climbed to more than 7%, which is the highest level since late November. According to Freddie Mac, the average rate on a 30-year fixed mortgage increased to 7.1% last week, and that's up from 6.8%. A year ago, the average rate was 6.39%. Rates on home loans have steadily climbed since January, although they are lower than the near 8% threshold that October saw. On the next Investigate TV Plus, a warning about water beads that are often labeled as non-toxic. We had followed all the best advice, and yet 
we were sitting here in the hospital. Hear from a mother who nearly lost her daughter and why government safety officials say parents should not always trust the toys packaging. Prince William returned to public duties today, which is the first time since his wife's cancer diagnosis. This comes as health problems continue to sideline the Princess of Wales and King Charles. NBC's Molly Hunter reports from London. Hello from a very sunny, springy day here in London. You can see the Buckingham Palace gardeners have been hard at work. Finally, it is sunny here at Buckingham Palace, but we have seen Prince William out and about his first public royal engagement since his wife, Kate, the Princess of Wales's cancer announcement before Easter for the last couple of weeks. The Wales family have been hunkering down, just the five of them. The family has asked for privacy. They often spend school holidays when the kids are off school at their country house in Norfolk. Well, this week, the kids are back to school and Prince William is back to work. Now, we saw pictures and video of him actually helping out in a kitchen at a food distribution center. It's a charity called Surplus to Suffer, and they redirect food and non-food items away from landfills and distribute it to local charities and those living in poverty outside of London and in West London. He was also visiting a youth center, both causes really part of his bigger environmental uh, causes. He works so hard to protect the environment in Kensington Palace as his visits today very much in line with those goals. No timeline, though, on when we will see Kate back to work. We know she's really been focused on recovery. She has asked for privacy for her and her family. Kensington Palace says she's eager to get back to work. She is ready, but really not to read too much into those first appearances whenever they happen, because she will be coming back kind of as she feels ready and well. The other big thing we're looking forward to early next month is possibly an appearance by Prince Harry on this side of the pond for an Invictus, Invictus excuse me, game ceremony in early May. And then in June, a big event trooping the colors, something we often see the whole royal family at. We will be waiting to see which members of the royal family, which members of the Wales family show up for that. Molly Hunter, NBC News, Buckingham Palace. And in today's Good News Now story, a man who simply stuck to his craft has become a TikTok superstar. Here's Sam Brock. What we do is we take a, like a heel popper and we pop that off. For anyone looking for a nice new soul, there may be no finer option than America's cobbler, Jim McFarland. How would you describe your job to someone who doesn't know what a cobbler is? A shoe cobbler is someone that takes your shoes and recrafts them back to the original factory condition. The family business built on buffing, stitching, and gluing beloved footwear goes back to 1900. We're in our 124th year. But Jim initially resisted the craft. I, I didn't want to be in this business. I saw how hard my dad worked. Still, he found himself back in the shop when his father got sick. Now his videos are captivating people around the world. His social media secret weapon, his daughter, Tori. Our first video that we posted got over 2 million views over the course of a week. But I think we were like, mm, that was just like a stroke of luck. Millions and millions of views on future posts proved it wasn't. Now he's making people smile. Ooh, she's so pretty. And some. A lot of people will send us letters. Are making him cry like this father who recently lost his 16-year-old son. He passed away four weeks ago, and they wear the same size boot. You take every ounce of love you have inside, and you put them into those boots, mm -hmm. and you hope when he puts those on, it gives him some kind of Band-Aid on his heart. He's touching souls for sure, the ones on our feet and those in our hearts. Sam Brock, NBC News, Lakeland, Florida. What an incredible story there. It's always amazing to see people stick to their crafts and uh, touch the lives of others along the way. We're going to end today's show with uh, some video sent in from our Keanu Tucker of some waves down by Diamond Head. It is some lovely conditions out there uh, today. It's a beautiful day to head out to the beach. If you are a surfer, wax up your board. Go ahead and get some of those swells rolling in. Check that out. Absolutely wonderful conditions for our surfer friends out there. Once again, this is video from Kiahi Tucker sent in a short time ago to our newsroom just off the side of Diamond Head. And let's take one more live look outside for uh, sunny conditions over Honolulu. I thank you all so much for tuning in to today's episode of This Is Now. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Aloha.